please a warm welcome, welcome back for Chris. So out of curiosity, um, how many people attended the event in Amsterdam? Wow. <laughs> wow, that, that is impressive. Um, so for those of you that did attend it, um, it is a similar uh, conversation that we're going to have today. Um, we've evolved even just in the past three months with our implementation and adoption of IT for IT. So I'm going to bring some of that into this presentation as well. Um, for those of you that did not attend, um, one of the, the more common themes that we heard in Amsterdam was the concept of change. We're seeing IT organizations kind of morph. We're seeing them adapt to some of the concepts Chris was just talking about with agile, lean, and um, the need to move faster is really driving how IT organizations are operating. So there's a lot of conversation out there around change and, and how we see organizations adapting to that, trying to stay on top of what the business needs, um, and more importantly, how to survive within an organization. Uh, so a little bit about myself before I get more into uh, the depth of the material. Uh, as Steve said, I've been in IT for about 20 years. I'm just over. And a large majority of my career has been focused uh, on different functions within IT, and more specifically around driving the adoption and the influence of leading edge, bleeding edge approaches within the organization. Within my last company, uh, where I spent about 18 years, a big chunk of that was experimenting with companies like IBM, with HP, with Microsoft, and, and others out there uh, as they wanted to look at bringing new technology into uh, the enterprises. Uh, that company was uh, a very large grocery company that serviced uh, several million people across the country, had about 1,800 um, locations and about 220,000 employees. So it was a great test bed for some of these companies to come in. Prior to leaving that organization, I had responsibility over enterprise automation and leveraging concepts like artificial intelligence and true um, you know, process automation, run book automation, kind of you name it. That was all inclusive of my responsibilities. Uh, over the past couple of years, uh, I decided to take a switch, and I joined Oracle. I've been with them for just over two years now, and my key role there is uh, around service management, but I'm also leading some um, efforts around digital transformation that we'll get into later on in the deck. Before I get into the meat of the story, I wanted to share a story with everybody kind of what drove me to the first implementation of IT for IT um, at this large grocery company. So I'm sitting in my office one day, and I get a phone call from the CIO. And he says, we need to be in the CEO's office in 30 minutes. Never a great conversation. You're thinking, do I have a job? Is IT being outsourced? What's going on there? So I kind of get my thoughts together. And I think about really the context behind it. The C CIO did not really know what this meeting was going to be about. So I start walking over you know, across the street to where the CEO's office was, sit down at the conference table that was within his office. And he asked one simple question. He says, how can we reduce the spend in IT? IT is one of our largest budgets. He had this grandiose vision around doing things in the retail operation space, reinvesting some of the money that he was spending on IT back into the business. So at the time, I was a little perplexed by what he was asking. You know, I thought that we had progressed from more of a order taker to a service provider for our business. We had the best of breed solutions. We were spending a lot on software. We were spending a lot on, on people. But the reality was is I wasn't looking at that overall service, which IT was providing, 
as a cost prohibitor for the company moving forward. So I asked the CEO to, to give me a day or two to, to think about it, and um, I started talking with various folks around the organization, started talking with some of my peers in the industry with this challenge that the CEO had given me. And I stumbled upon one of my peers at um, Hewlett Packard, HP, who said, hey, we're getting into this brand new thing. It's called IT for IT. Um, it's a consortium of a bunch of different companies, and they're all contributing to this new standard. That might be a good thing for you to look at. So we started having some conversations around it, and ultimately, um, I got back to the CEO and said, I have an idea. I know that we're spending a lot on software. I know that we're spending a lot on people. How about I dig into this new approach and see if it's not someplace that we could end up saving some money? So that's exactly what we did. We started sourcing all of the software, all of the tools that were out in the environment. We talked with all 1,200 employees. We surveyed their laptops through discovery technologies. We had interviews with people. And what we found out was there were 1,300 IT tools and applications that were deployed across 1,200 employees. There's no way that we could have consistency with that. People were downloading whatever they wanted. They had open source. They had um, software that we were paying licensing for. And ultimately, people across departments in IT, and sometimes even within the same department, weren't using the same tools, weren't speaking the same language, uh, and uh, found that it was very difficult to, to get work done. We also discovered that we had 1,500 unique business applications that IT was supporting. So between the two of them, 2,800 applications that IT was either managing, supporting, deploying, so on and so forth. So ultimately, we jumped into the IT for IT effort. We found a way that we could use the structure of IT for IT, and this is way back in version 1.1 of IT for IT, to identify our solutions, come up with rationalization approaches, think about leveraging the automation that we were already doing within IT, and optimize that towards the process, ultimately getting people to use the same software. When we initially started the effort, we were targeting about 20 to $30 million of savings. By the time I left the company about two and a half years ago, we had reached $70 million. Since that point, I believe it's up an additional 20 to $30 million, uh, where they've reached almost $100 million in savings through the rationalization efforts. So how did we do it? Um, we took the framework for IT for IT and each one of the value streams around it, and through these interviews and the surveys and the discovery that we did with every single person, we mapped the applications based on the purpose and the, the function that those applications serviced back into each one of the value streams. What this graphic is showing you here, and I apologize, it's a little bit small, but it's showing you that as we mapped out each one of these applications, we had an overabundance of certain applications based on the value chain. Service monitoring, for example, 280 80 applications just for doing monitoring with NIT. That's absurd. You know, no wonder when we said, well, this is saying that the CPU is high, and this one's saying that the CPU is within normal. We didn't know how to react to that. We weren't efficient as an IT organization because we had gone out, we had purchased the best of breed software, but in almost every single case, it was duplicated. But what was interesting as we started to map all this out against the IT for IT value chains is that we had deficiencies. We had core pieces of this reference architecture that we had absolutely no tools for. So when you look at that reference architecture and you understand here are the inputs and outputs across each one of the components of it or the boxes that you see there in the diagram, 
There were certain things that we thought that we were doing as a very mature ITIL organization that we weren't doing. Or it was being done manual in some cases. We then broke it down even further. And here is where you can see, you know, looking at that service monitoring track under the detect a correct value stream, that we just had tool after tool after tool after tool. And granted, some of those were large, so they could have been application suites like you know, BMC or HP in some cases. Um, but there was no consistency. And because we had all of these unique or disparate tools, none of them, or very few of them, were actually integrated across the board. So we were asking our employees to use probably three, four times the amount of tools that they needed. So as an example, as we went through and we mapped all this out and then started through the rationalization effort, we could take the 280 service monitoring tools that were there and able to reduce it down to 15. And then across the various teams, whether that was application development, whether that was data center operations, whether that was um, just the core BSM team themselves, they were all using the same tools, they were all speaking the same language, and they could do very efficient handoffs across teams. Ultimately, the work effort led to creating a reference architecture of our own within IT. We called this the ITOM reference architecture, and what it did was it pulled all of the tools across all of our IT service management functions into one view. And we could see exactly how automation played in that picture. We could see how the CMDB played in that picture. And ultimately, how these teams needed to operate. And more importantly, how they could grow in the future. So if they wanted to buy a new tool, how would that interact based on the IT for IT model? So who here has not heard of Oracle? <laughs> As I said in Amsterdam, I'm not here to sell anything. I'm with the internal IT group. So you don't need to worry about architecture slides or, or any of that. Um, but I wanted to share some statistics. Um, I think everybody's heard of Oracle, but they may not know to what extent or how you know, large we are in the industry. Um, as I started compiling all these statistics together, I found a couple of things very interesting. One is I didn't realize that we were deployed to about 22 billion devices. Um, so every time that you get the Java update on your phone or your PC and you're screaming at Java, guess what? You know, we're responsible for that. Um, we have uh, in total about 152,000 employees and contractors. And like many other companies out there, we're in a mode of trans, uh, transformation. We hear the, the shift to the digital enterprise, we hear digital transformation, we hear agile DevOps, so on and so forth. Oracle's no different. Uh, about a year ago um, at our conference in San Francisco, we made it an announcement that we're moving away from the software business. Not necessarily software itself, but the way that we do software. So one of those, uh, those major points that came out of this is, as we shift from a software company, we want to become a cloud company. We want to offer all of our software in the cloud to our customers, which also mean that internally within IT, we had to adopt what we were telling our customers. So all of the on-prem software, data center-centric software and applications that we had within IT, we had to get into our own cloud um, with our CEO's ambition and our CTO's ambition of becoming the largest cloud company in the world. You know, we have to start at the roots of the organization. So we started scrambling around, you know, how are we going to do that? <clears throat> but in order to understand how we were going to do it, we had to understand how we got to where we were. So many years back, way before I had joined the company, Oracle had gone through a massive amount of acquisitions. 
And like any company that does acquisitions, integration standardization is always one of the hardest things to do. We had multiple ERP systems. We had multiple um, email systems, multiple service management platforms. Uh, and there really was no standardization across the company. And through each acquisition that was done, it was acceptable to have all of these kind of snowflakes, if you will, out there in the environment. From an IT perspective, that became extremely difficult to manage. That uh, as each acquisition happened, we now had to support a new ERP system or a new email system or whatever it may be. Each network was unique. Each um, kind of employee profile was unique. So it made it extremely difficult to sustain that approach. So then we got in this mode of, hey, let's adopt ITIL. ITIL is going to fix all of our problems. We're going to have one standard framework for managing IT. And in all honesty, we adopted ITIL and we did it 100%. We adopted it as if we were a level five maturity organization. So everything in that ITIL book got implemented. And what ended up happening is IT started alienating themselves from our internal customers. And in some regards to our external customers as well that relied on Oracle for support. We said we're gonna take these multiple ERP systems and shrink them down to one. IT knows what's best for our business, and we're going to do all the work on their behalf. We said we're going to standardize. We said that we're going to reduce the amount of offerings that we could give our business. Because after all, you know, within IT, we thought we knew what the business wanted. But in all reality, that ended up alienating us even further. Our customers no longer wanted to work with IT. And as a result, during that phase, we saw new IT organizations, not pseudo IT, complete IT organizations being spun up specific to lines of business within the company. So now we had the problem of, all right, well, we said we were going to standardize all of our, our applications and hardware and all of our IT assets. But now we have three IT organizations that do, or five, it, five IT organizations that do change management, that do incident management, that have their own access and controls around specific infrastructure that nobody else does. So that created a bigger challenge than just the duplication of software itself. As all of these unique IT organizations started to spin up across the enterprise, we ended up slowing ourselves down tenfold compared to where we were before. We didn't know how to operate, let alone as one IT organization or three, four, five IT organizations. So what we would look at in terms of a project delivery being maybe three to five months before was now taking two years. Our customers were getting more and more frustrated with IT. And at this time, we started to see some of the dynamics change within the industry. Things like iPhones. You know, everybody had an iPhone. And what happens when you have an iPhone? You download an app, it's intuitive, you get it in seconds. That's what our customers were expecting from us. And we could not deliver. We started seeing things like cloud computing, like DevOps, like Agile, starting to come around us. And I can remember it was 2007, just down the street from here. Gartner was having a conference called Catalyst. And it was the first time that Gartner publicly came out and said, if companies don't start looking at cloud, start, don't start adopting cloud, they're not going to survive in the future. The model of having your own data centers and managing your own data centers and having high cost resources is no longer sustainable for any organization. And, and I was kind of floored when I, when I heard that. They were also talking about some of the concepts around big data and internet of things. But the cloud discussion itself, um, especially being an old infrastructure guy, kind of took, took me to heart that 
I may be out of a job in the future. Over the course of the past two to three, four or five years, give or take, depending upon what industry you're in, you start hearing terms like continuous integration, continuous delivery. You start seeing IT organizations trying to restructure to say, how do I get out of this ITIL structure and more into that lean or agile approach? And it's a big struggle for a lot of companies. Our customers are expecting that we deliver at a much quicker pace, that we're not soliciting requirements and two years later delivering a project that is no longer matched to those requirements. Internally within Oracle, we've seen the same thing. As an IT organization, as I mentioned previously, we're focused on cloud. 100% of what we're doing within IT is matched towards that goal of being a cloud-first organization, being a consumer of our own technology. And to give you a couple of stats, which Mark Heard, one of our CEOs, came out with at Open World a couple of years ago, is he predicts by 2025, 100% of all dev and test will be out in the cloud, that that will no longer sit on-prem other than maybe a developer's laptop when they check out an environment. We're seeing, or he's predicting, I should say, 80% of production is going to sit in cloud. So just quick show of hands, who in the room has not started deploying to cloud? Yeah. So we're seeing that explosive change out there. Cloud gives you the dynamics to be able to quickly deploy, you know, scale it down when it's not needed, scale it up when it is needed. Elasticity, containers, some of the new technologies that are coming out almost on a daily basis now are enabling us to move at a much quicker pace. But what we found internally within IT is if we continue operating in an IT model, cloud does nothing for us except give us a new compute platform. So we've had to change a lot of our processes, a lot of our procedures for supporting cloud. So another story, very similar to the CEO story I told before. About a year ago, my CEO or CIO calls me again, another you know, not great conversation around, if we do not change the way that we operate within IT, Within five years, we will no longer be an IT organization. It will either be outsourced or move to potentially another IT organization within the company. And so he presented a, a unique challenge to his leadership team, which is what can we do to bring value to our customers and to um, continually deliver value, but move at that much quicker pace? Keeping in mind that our number one objective still was to move everything to the cloud, we had to support the evolution of our company that was also going through that same objective. So I brought back some of the experience that I did with my previous company and said, hey, here was a framework that we tried. Um, I'm not gonna share a ton of detail around it, um, primarily because at that point in time, methodologies and frameworks uh, were basically a four-letter word within Oracle. You know, they wanted to do their own thing, their own flavor of everything. So I said, I'd, I'd like to go investigate this and see if it applies to what we're doing within Oracle, and he left it at that. And so we started with a small team, and we built that team as an agile team to go and take a look at um, IT for IT and applying that with our transformation. So we started out with some of the, the, the core things. We looked at ITIL, we looked at DevOps. We said, should we operate as a waterfall organization? Should we start looking at Agile? We knew that we had to change as an IT organization, but we didn't really know how. We knew that we could use IT for IT for part of it, but not all of it. We wanted to use IT for IT as the base for our digital transformation efforts. We had a pretty big problem though. When we went back and started looking at 
all of our processes, all 26 ITIL processes, we only had two that were actually connected to an asset management solution. And what you don't see up there is we had no CMDB. So we had no centralized management around configuration items in the environment. Our processes were all standalone. And just like the, the previous company I was at, each process had its unique tool. And the tools were not integrated in any way at all. So we weren't effective when it came to service management. We weren't effective as an IT organization because everything was isolated in nature. So then we started looking at pulling IT for IT into this. We started looking at what were the inputs and outputs of each process segment within the value streams. What did we need to concentrate on? And again, looking at this holistically across all 26 processes, we knew at some point we needed to change from this traditional model to more agile-like. So we kept that in the back of our minds as we started re-engineering all of our processes. We knew that they had to be integrated. We knew that information had to flow from process to process. And we had to streamline these processes as much as possible so that we could operate at that new expected approach. So we started with configuration management. <clears throat> that was our keystone for all of the other processes. But instead of having a tool to manage a CMDB like so many of us have out there, we said, why don't we let the automation take care of that? If we're going to build a cloud solution, we're going to use automation to deploy, to manage, to do everything around configuration management within the cloud. Why don't we just have it more as a reporting mechanism than an actual CMDB? So we changed our approach. We took some people out of the equation that would manage a CMDB or our asset management solution before that. We started looking at some of these new ways of working. So change management can be done via automation versus having a complex change approval board. Release management can be fully automated other than somebody reviewing the package and approving it. And we could start looking at methods like extreme programming and have your test models done before you even develop the code. Over time, um, and this took us about seven or eight months, we could take all 26 ITIL processes and shrink that down to 15. Instead of buying tools and figuring out the process, we started with the process and then did tooling associated with it. As mentioned, we leveraged IT for IT as the core foundation for all of our process re-engineering. What we ended up doing was taking years and years of process development um, ever since that very robust ITIL implementation and threw it out the door. We decided we were not going to use any of this. Rather, we were going to lean on IT for IT to help prescribe exactly how we were going to operate as an IT organization. Anywhere from strategy to operational support, um, all of that was included in this. What we then did was we said we need an actual operating model, not just a process framework, but a, an operating model that we can start figuring out how are we going to work as an IT organization. So we leaned on CEB to help us out with their digital enterprise model um, to understand how Agile could be applied to a very traditional INO organization. How could we have that business relationship that we've never fully understood or have never been able to successfully accomplish? And so we leaned on CEB for that. We then analyzed multiple agile frameworks that were out there. Um, and this was the biggest challenge for us. Within IT, um, Oracle IT has 7,500 people in total. We support um, 40,000 developers. And we have you know, an exorbitant amount of business partners that we work with on a daily basis. The scaled agile framework was something that we could leverage 
And it applied perfectly on top of IT for IT for being able to operate in a fast, efficient, and predictable model. We could take things like centralized decisions, push them down into teams. We could allow teams to be self-forming in some regards. Um, we could become more of that rapid delivery mechanism that our business was expecting. So if we look at where we started in terms of IT for IT, um, we started at the beginning. And that was first understanding what we needed and how we would operate as we rebuilt or re-engineered all of these processes. We had four value streams that we started out with, the four from IT for IT that you see, and we mapped the processes against those and started creating agile teams within Oracle to re-engineer, rewrite, redesign each one of these processes. We started with the select few to test out that model. Configuration management, as I said, was uh, kind of the keystone to everything. But we did that in parallel with change management, with incident management, with test management, so that we could create this cohesive process model behind that. As we started developing these processes, we started thinking about how could each execution point within the process be handled by either a tool or more preferably automation with the ultimate goal of not having a single person needed to execute these processes. They're just done behind the scenes. We then expanded on that. <clears throat> we looked at other value streams, um, especially strategy to uh, portfolio, the requirements to uh, deploy those types of um, value streams so then we could understand how did we interact with the business? How could we actually build solutions and make sure that the requirements that the business had of IT were continually met? So not the, the old process of get requirements up front, deliver two years later. It's a checkpoint throughout the way. And that's something Scaled Agile helps us understand as well. We then looked at completing this. Um, we looked at the architecture function, which is something that uh, we within our IT organization abandoned years ago. So we're re-implementing architecture into the environment. So as I said, each one of these um, lays over one another very nicely. So if I look at strategy to portfolio, for example, we can look at the safe concept or piece uh, for strategy, and it plays into each one of those processes very nicely. We look at tooling, and all of our tooling has been realigned back to those processes. Um, something that, that you'll see through these slides is we haven't gone out and invested a tremendous amount in enterprise software to achieve IT for IT. We're able to do this with very common open source products and get that consistency across IT to where they're using the same products, whether that's JIRA, whether that is Confluence, whether it is um, a couple of in, uh, homegrown types of tools. We've simplified, just like with my last company, the number of products that we have to manage our IT processes. Here's another one looking at requirements to deploy, and this is um, really holistic of that project lifecycle. So once I get requirements and once I understand what's strategic for the organization, how do I build solutions? How do I leverage things like Scrum, like XP, like Lean and Agile to continually put releases out, to continually drive value back into the organization? Here's an example of, you know, again, how we're using open source tools. So if I'm managing source code, you know, it could be a tool like Git. It could be a tool like Subversion um, using Hudson and Jenkins for deployment chains. One of the <clears throat> unique things that we found with this is that when we were analyzing all of our tools, it created a new type of culture within IT. So in years past, for example, infrastructure teams and application developers were highly segregated. So through the use of 
our process re-engineering, the adoption of several different frameworks, we now have those teams working directly together. We're seeing roles change in the environment that we don't have a server engineer, we have a DevOps engineer that handles both application and operating system. We're seeing concepts like software-defined data centers, where everything in our environment is being transferred to code. So it's really changing not only the way that we do it, but the skill sets within our IT organization. And I'm going to breeze through a couple of these since we're running short on time here. Um, <coughs> Once we understood kind of the, the model around how we would operate, whether that was from a, a process standpoint or the digital enterprise standpoint from CEB, or even some of the project methodologies like Agile, Scrum, Lean, that we would see through the implementation of SAFE, we then had to think about how we operated as an IT organization holistically. So what we did was we ended up restructuring the functions within IT, not necessarily from an org chart perspective, but really what we delivered within IT around the IT for IT framework. So we looked at our portfolio management. We could align that to strategy to portfolio. We looked around project delivery, those DevOps types of skill sets put that into requirements to deploy. Um, so what we've ended up doing was, um, before where it was a very siloed organization based on technology discipline, it's now aligned back to not only our internal processes, but the overall framework of IT for IT. So where did that get us? Um, we're about a year into this transformation. Uh, the goal is by 2020, that will be completely transformed from running a bimodal or multimodal IT organization, which we are currently into 100% of this digital enterprise model. Uh, we've gone through one implementation of this where they've tested out new processes, new procedures, new tooling, um, the whole agile methodology, uh, where that went live two weeks ago that consisted of 64 application components, about 700 virtual servers, all running in our cloud environment. We saw things like the provisioning of a virtual server within our IaaS environment go from roughly two months to about two hours, give or take, including all validation. We're seeing a tremendous amount of productivity gain based on re-engineering the processes, leveraging some of these newer technologies, and getting consistency across the IT organization. Over the course of the next year, our goal is to reposition 100% of the applications that we have that are hosted in our data centers to this cloud environment. And our plan is now that we have a tested framework in place to lean on what was developed over the course of the past year. Um, we've also seen a, a heavy dependency on automation. So we've been able to eliminate about 80% of where a human was involved in the IT processes before, eliminated. And give you an example, change management, we all do change management. When we re-engineered that process, we went from a 10-day request to approval cycle to 24 hours. Rob England has a, a thing out there, he's uh, also known as the IT skeptic, that's called Kill the Cap. And we took that into heart to say, we want to reinvent how IT is done within Oracle. And we were able to leverage various tools and frameworks out there to make that happen. We don't see this complex and heavy overhead around review, approval, implementation. We can put the trust into our people we can get consistent through the use of automation so that you don't need the heavy overhead. And with that being said, I'm going to leave you with one quote, and this is one of my favorite quotes out there, um, which is essentially saying, you know, we're going to go through a journey. And it's not necessarily um, what's important during that journey. You're going to learn as you go through it. 
But as you get to the end of it, you're going to realize you know, the importance of all of the events that have kind of built up to that. Okay. Thank you for your time. Chris, thank you. Please uh, take a seat. <clears throat> Lots of questions coming in, unsurprisingly. Um, first one was very early on. Um, the Oracle introduction slide said you had seven and a half thousand uh, folks in IT, mm -hmm. uh, and you supported forty thousand internal developers. Why do you not see them as part of IT? Um, so the seventy-five hundred and, and great question. Seventy-five hundred <clears throat> is specific to. Um, the internal roles that are needed to either support application development or cloud team or um, lines of business. Right. So as I was talking about, we ended up with five distinct IT organizations. That's actually down to three at this point. Right. Um, and each one of those IT organizations has a customer that they support. Mm -hmm. um, so the 40,000 developers are actually supported through our um, product development IT organization. Technically, yes, they are part of IT, um, but we count them separately because they're developing products that we sell right. out of the marketplace. Right. No, fair enough. Um, let's see. Uh, do you use the configuration management component to capture the IT service throughout its life cycle? Um, so if we look at the new model um, and what we've started operating with over the, the course of the past year, um, we use tools like Kafka. Um, we use tools like Chef and um, Get and a couple of other tools in there that through real-time analysis, because they know what's been deployed, um, they're keeping a repository of information that we can always go back and say, this is the current state of your configuration items. Um, what we're seeing in cloud is things are spinning up and spinning down so quickly that we abandoned the traditional CMDB so that we could keep up with the dynamics. Okay, so related, uh, can you say a little more about how you um, went about so selecting the tools? You said you didn't spend a lot of money on enterprise mm -hmm. software. Um, <clears throat> what was the process for selecting tools? So one of the, the unique opportunities that we had um, out of the three IT organizations, we were the first to go out into the uh, Oracle's public cloud. Uh, it was still basically you know, a concept. We had a couple of customers on it, but nothing at scale. Um, and as we were developing the cloud product itself, we partnered with our cloud team to say, these are the types of tools enterprises would need it or would need. Mm -hmm. um, so we did a, a ton of analysis. We looked at various tools that were out there, um, but we built the model so it was very modular and flexible in design. So if we decided that Chef was not the right tool for us, we could replace that with, you know, what other type of automation or orchestration platform. Okay. All right. Um, back to the retailer example. How, do you, how did you measure the cost savings at the retailer? Uh, what metrics were the best to show the savings? Mm -hmm. uh, so we did it in two different ways. Um, we did it one by uh, product elimination. Um, so as we went through and rationalized the entire suite of products, we were looking at more enterprise types of solutions. Um, so we went with a couple of things that kind of replaced, say, 20, 30, 50 isolated products. Mm -hmm. um, so as we eliminated all of these products that we were paying for, obviously there's you know, substantial savings right there. Uh, the other uh, savings that we measured was through labor savings itself. In some cases, that was headcount reduction. In other cases, we were looking at productivity um, that was seen through the automation and, and other tooling. Okay, thank you. Um, sounds like this is from someone who's been through a alienation phase themselves. Um, it seems like you're saying the, that using IT for IT helped free you from the shackles of ITIL. <laughs> is that right? And if so, can you say more about how? I mean, <laughs> Shack shackles, that's a great word. Um, mm. IT for IT um, supported ITIL in my previous company. 
Um, so we leveraged that framework or reference architecture to complement their ITIL implementation. Um, because ITIL is that four letter word at Oracle, we used um, IT for IT for actually getting away from it. Right. And we did it in a, a manner that we did not tell people um, outside of that initial group that we were adopting an industry reference architecture to build all of our processes upon. And once they saw, wow, this is really efficient, this works great, we said, oh, by the way, guess what we used? Right. Yeah, I hear that quite a lot. Don't mention the word, just get on. Just it do it, yeah. yeah. Uh, what role do you see the technical staff, like DevOps engineers and developers, playing in an organization like the Open Group? Within the Open Group or just in general? Uh, well, the question is specifically an organization like the Open Group, so like uh, coming together and working on, uh, on standards. And, uh, I, I think, um, well, how do I want to say this? I, I mean, it's a, a good question. It, if you look at the dynamics of how technology is changing, every year and a half to two years we're seeing a significant transformation within the IT technical skill sets. Mm -hmm. Five years ago, it would be very normal to have a technology specific role. Today, those types of roles are being morphed into more of the DevOps mm -hmm. types of roles, more specialized generalists. So what I, I've always recommended to my staff and others in the industry is the more that you can collaborate, socialize, um, either through forums like this or through other DevOps types of mechanisms, that's the best thing to do right now. Um, we need to stay on top of it, and it's very difficult to do with how IT continually is reinventing itself right now. Right, okay. Um, how much of your effort was spent on gaining insight into the effects of the changes that were made? i.e. next to the primary functional changes, did you have a strategy in place to actually show their effects? Mm -hmm. So the, there was a very structured reporting um, and analytics piece behind both of them. Um, so one of the things I always want to do is not just adopt something and say, oh yeah, it, it worked, I feel that it works better. Um, what you need to do is continually sell this and improve mm -hmm. upon it. So with both implementations, it was a continual review, um, typically six months after the implementation to say, where do we need to tweak things? Where are we not getting the value that we expected? Mm -hmm. um, and we do that across all four value chains. Um, with the Oracle implementation, because we're also adapting Agile into the IT organization, we actually have um, structured teams that that's what they're chartered for. So just like you would develop a product or an app dev team would develop a product, right. we have an app dev team that is specific to the processes and they go through the same approach that everybody else does. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate on how you went about automated discovery and mapping of IT components? Uh, curious <laughs> to know why a tool such as ServiceNow was not deemed feasible. Um, so in my previous company, um, they actually had very robust discovery capabilities. Uh, we were in a state of going from BMC Remedy to ServiceNow. So when this mapping was done, actually both showed up there um, because we were at that transitional state. Um, and even when I left the company two and a half years ago, which was two years into their ServiceNow implementation, they still had both running. Um, so multiple discovery tools were used. From a um, desktop or a client perspective, there were tools like HPCA that were used. In the data center, um, we used BMC discovery. We used um, some other types of things. We did not use the ServiceNow discovery, but it was able to effectively get all software that was deployed you know, through the, the various tools that we used. Okay. Um, getting close to having to quit. What percentage of the transformation budget was targeted to retraining and or uh, sourcing changes? 
So in the previous company, it was more of a grassroots effort. So as we did rationalization, most of the training came internally, so there was not a significant amount of budget associated with it, even though we were recouping a large amount of money. In Oracle, we're taking a different approach because we're completely uprooting the structure, the methodologies, and the framework within IT, um, and we're completely abandoning ITIL. We're spending a significant amount of money on training, retooling, and whether that is to understand the methodologies or that's even to train people in the new tooling that's, you know, that's being implemented, um, which is why you see a three-year implementation on this. You know, we're touching a lot of people. We're also training the business as we go through this. So the business goes through the exact same um, methodology training that IT does because our goal is that they're going to be operating together. Okay. Um, two, two quickies. Um, uh, and you kind of answered what the Oracle view on this is already, I think. But can IT for IT replace ITIL completely? I don't believe that it can. Yeah. And if you look at how IT for IT has been constructed, it leverages pieces of ITIL. Mm -hmm. It leverages pieces of COBIT and ISO and you know various other frameworks that are out there. It's kind of the best of breed, figuring out what's worked out there in the industry. Um, if you talk to um, anybody out there, you know whether that's the Gartner, the Forrester, um, and even some of the DevOps folks, that they'll say ITIL is not dead, but ITIL is dated. And what we see is some of these new things like Agile, adopting pieces of it, but doing it in different ways. Mm -hmm. So. Um, my advice to companies is you know, figure out as you're going through your digital transformation is what pieces are actually critical to support ITIL. You still have to do change management. You still have to do incident management. But how you do it can be done completely differently. OK. And last one, uh, have you written a case study of your uh, experience of using IT for IT and the transformation, and if not, can we get one? <laughs> and it wasn't me asking the question, it's Dan here. <laughs> um, I co-authored a piece uh, that HP had done a couple of years ago, and we're actually in the process of writing one specific to Oracle right now. Right. Um, okay. So whomever asked that question, you know, hit me up and be more than happy to have you uh, as an early adopter of that white paper. Okay, Chris, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much.